Today on Not Sam Wrestling, CM Punk is back in the WWE. I can't believe I'm saying this. In anybody else's hands, this is just a podcast. But in my hands, this is Not Sam Wrestling. I don't know that I have ever been more excited to step down into the Not Sam studio and to speak directly to you. Welcome to episode 475 of Not Sam Wrestling and maybe the most historically significant episode of Not Sam Wrestling in this modern era of Not Sam Wrestling. Because not only is this the first official episode in which rule number three, we don't fantasy book Randy Orton, is completely thrown out the window. But I dare say that today we have the greatest this week in CM Punk segment in the history of Not Sam Wrestling. I don't think that I have to be the one to explain to you that on Saturday night in the All-State Arena, in Rosemont, Illinois, in the shadow of Chicago, the hometown of the Second City Saint. At the end of a pretty great Survivor Series War Games pay-per-view, a pay-per-view that delivered on the return of Randy Orton, all kinds of smiles coming out of the War Games matches, just as we thought we were going to have a a, a great, happy drift off to bed on a Saturday night. The little copyright logo came up. The little logo that said, stay tuned, the press conference is coming up next came up. I started thinking to myself, ah, we're mere moments away from Hunter Hearst Helmsley putting his glasses on and explaining to us that this is the highest grossing Survivor Series in the 37 years of Survivor Series. But oh no! We weren't done yet because what I didn't realize and what I think a lot of us didn't realize is that we were not just looking at the end screen of a show. No, no, no. This was a Triple H, Mike Mansuri, NXT TakeOver era fake out end of the show. One of my favorite tools that has ever been used. The little Chiron comes up. Guess that's the end of the show. Nope. One more thing. It's like what Steve Jobs used to do at all those Apple events. Oh, and one more thing. And here comes the one that you're going to be calling home about. Because just as that those logos came up on the corners of your screen, we heard a noise that had been wildly speculated about for quite some time. But a noise that we weren't sure that we'd ever hear on WWE television again. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of people were quite sure that they would not hear on WWE television again. That noise, we all know. Anybody who's a wrestling fan knows. What comes after? The pop, the ovation, the sound that Chicago made when the opening riffs of Cult of Personality hit and that old logo, not the logo that was very, very similar in AEW, but that original old logo, the logo that dates back to Money in the Bank 2011 when Cult of Personality was first used in WWE. That logo flashes on the screen. And there was this amazing ovation because there are a lot of ovations, right? A lot of different types of ovations. Some ovation, and they're all great. Some ovations are just, yes, and everybody cheers. Some ovations are, it's exactly what I wanted. Some ovations are, I knew it, awesome. And some ovations, some ovations are the Yabu, right? John Cena coming back at the Royal Rumble in Madison Square Garden. All so excited, yeah. Oh, I forgot we're supposed to boo John Cena, boo. But really it's yeah, because we didn't expect this. What we got for CM Punk at Survivor Series in Chicago was the what yeah, what yeah, because nobody could believe it was actually happening. 
the idea that like you just saw Randy Orton come back. You just saw Randy Orton hit an RKO on J.D. McDonough as he was flung off the roof of War Games. We're good. We've seen the end of the show. Oh, yeah! And 17,000 people in an arena with a wooden roof blew the thing off and sent it right to O'Hare Airport. And oh, the timing. Oh, the delicious timing of looking in that entranceway and hearing the music and seeing the videos playing on all the screens. It said CM Punk. The logos of CM Punk popping up everywhere. But you didn't believe it until you saw the man. You didn't, you said, no, 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 no. I've been gotten before. You ain't gonna work me, pal. What is this? Is this Paul Heyman coming out? Is this the Ryback making an appearance? Is, who knows what this could be? Oh, it's the man himself. Phil Brooks, CM Punk, walks out wearing a white t-shirt and some blue jeans, checking his watch and letting everybody know, oh yeah, once again, it's clobbering time. The place goes nuts. I mean nuts. He's getting hugs from people in the front row that look like it was an in-your-house ready to knock over the guardrails on top of Shawn Michaels. I mean, this is something 10 years in the making. It was Royal Rumble 2014. We are two months shy of 10 years removed from WWE. The last guy who you would never see in a WWE arena again is standing in a WWE arena. This is the name that WWE on-screen talent would never utter. You'd never hear a reference to CM Punk unless it was very, very heavily veiled. You'd never hear those initials in the word punk. You wouldn't even talk about punk music on WWE television. And now here he is, right in front of our faces, just standing there. And all of a sudden you realize, whether you like CM Punk, whether you hate CM Punk, whether you think he's good for wrestling, whether you think he's bad for wrestling, whether you've established your own opinions on the drama that he's been through and you think he's at fault or not at fault, whether you have no opinion on the drama that he's been through. The one thing that nobody can argue is that the minute this guy shows up, everything changes. You go back, the history of CM Punk, and that's what this guy does. Okay, so CM Punk shows up to WWE in 2006. He had made an incredible name for himself in the independents. He had had an unbelievable run in Ring of Honor as Ring of Honor champion, had classics with Samoa Joe. He'd been in IWA Mid-South having these amazing 60-minute, 90-minute classics with guys like Chris Hero. And on his way out of Ring of Honor, has like the quintessential, the very first Summer of Punk run where people thought they were going to the last CM Punk match, but he won the world title and spent the, the Ring of Honor superstars had to spend the entire summer trying to get the title away from him so that the devil, which everything MJF is saying about the devil is based on CM Punk calling himself the devil. So that the devil didn't show up in the WWE with the Ring of Honor title. Well, after that amazing run, he goes to Ohio Valley Wrestling, spends his time there, and the WWE didn't get him. This wasn't a period of time where every big name independent was getting signed by the WWE or by AEW. As a matter of fact, most big name independents were not getting signed by the WWE. There was a whole group of guys that it was like, well, they're big on the independents, but they're not like a WWE guy. That's not a thing anymore. That doesn't exist anymore. But it existed and it existed hard in the early 2000s, especially as WCW and ECW were out of business. Because now WWE, from the mainstream perspective in America, was shaping the industry as they saw fit. But there was something undeniable about CM Punk. The way, the look this guy had, the way he made people feel, it was never... 
the matches specifically. It was the way he made people feel. It was something about him that he instantly made people feel. They bring back ECW, WWE does. And Paul Heyman himself picks out CM Punk. No, this is the guy. This is the guy that I want. Paul Heyman sees something in CM Punk and anybody that knows anything about extreme championship wrestling, the minute you see CM Punk in the early 2000s, you go, yeah, that would have been the biggest star in extreme championship wrestling had it still been around. And, you know, 2006, 2005, 2004, we're still only a, a few years removed from that company going out of business. So CM Punk shows up, instantly becomes a big name in WWE's ECW revamp under Paul Heyman. But real quickly, Paul Heyman ends up out of the WWE. He's not in charge of the ECW brand anymore, and he's nowhere in the WWE organization. So now CM Punk is, is, is on an island, and people still don't get this guy. They do recognize how popular he is, though, right? He ends up winning the Money in the Bank briefcase, I think twice. But that first Money in the Bank briefcase win, I think is one of the things that truly established the power of that Money in the Bank briefcase. That you looked at CM Punk when he first won the Money in the Bank briefcase and you said, that guy's never gonna be the world champion of WWE. That was the thing about CM Punk. I love him. He's my favorite wrestler. But as somebody that's watched this product for as many years as I've watched this product, that guy with the straight edge tattoo across his abs and the long hair and the piercings and everything he's got going on. I love him. He's never gonna be WWE champion. And he wins the Money in the Bank briefcase and somehow he displays the power of that briefcase by becoming the world heavyweight champion. It's amazing, somewhat short-lived. It is what it is. He does fantastic things. Straight edge society, awesome. Whole program with Jeff Hardy, awesome. But it's not until 2011 that everything changes for CM Punk. In 2011, CM Punk is coming to the end of his WWE contract. And he is offered an opportunity that nobody in that era is offered, which is, hey, tonight at the end of Monday Night Raw, take that microphone and air your grievances. Work a shoot, shoot a work, whatever you want to call it. And CM Punk lets the audience know that in anyone else's hands, this microphone is just a microphone, but in his hands, it's a pipe bomb. And CM Punk drops the pipe bomb promo leading into Money in the Bank 2011. And that pipe bomb promo, I believe, is certainly the most impactful promo of that entire decade. It's only 2011 at that point. I dare you to find a promo in the 2010s that is more important than the pipe bomb promo. We could sit here right now and have a conversation as to whether or not it was the most important promo in the history of wrestling. You're going back to Austin 316 at the 1996 King of the Ring to find a more impactful, more important, more industry-shifting promo than the pipe bomb promo. And not only does it shift the industry, but that single promo makes him a star for the rest of his life. He was good, but there's no turning back after that. And it's very rare that there's a promo that can do that. It goes to the 2011 Money in the Bank. He wins the title from John Cena. He disappears. It was a magical moment. He only disappears for like a week. It gets muddy. And he gets dissatisfied with what's going on in the WWE. In 2014 you know, whatever, three years removed, less than that, two and a half years, I guess, he uh, decides uh, after the Royal Rumble match that he's done. He describes himself as being hurt, as being sick, and just being over it. He was looking at going to WrestleMania to have a match reportedly with Triple H. He didn't want to do that. And he decided to walk out of the company after the Royal Rumble 2014. People are waiting, but nothing is happening. All is quiet on the Western front. We go all the way till November, Thanksgiving of 2014. Whatever it is, 10 months later, 
and he and Colt Cabana drop a podcast that you I mean you talk about. I mean, it, it's the most impactful wrestling podcast of all time. And after that podcast is dropped, and after lawsuits are filed, and after I mean, it it that podcast resulted in lawsuits. That podcast resulted in in friendships being ended. That podcast resulted in elements of the industry being exposed uh, to to a mass public for the very first time. And Punk is gone. Punk goes over to the UFC. And in, uh, you know, 2015 or so, 2015, 2016, 2017, he has a couple of UFC fights. Unsuccessful, clearly not ready to be a, a, a professional MMA fighter against people that have been doing this all their lives. But still, he made it happen. And I'm going to guess anybody that trains for a fight on a professional level could probably kick my ass or your ass, right? So he does that, and and really, anytime he speaks about wrestling, which is seldom, he speaks about it as if it is pretty far in his past, that he's over it, he's done with it. Except in 2019, he makes a surprise uh, announcement. It was it was it was widely speculated about, uh, uh, but it becomes official. In 2019, uh, as part of Fox's deal with the WWE, with, with SmackDown moving over to Fox, a show called WWE Backstage is premiered on the Fox Sports Network, which is reportedly not a WWE show. It is a Fox show. I guess it's done in partnership with WWE, but it's not a WWE show. And the reason that, that emphasis is made is because that is the caveat. The checks that are signed say Fox, not WWE, when they are given to the person who shocks the world by showing up as an analyst on that show, CM Punk. His first foray back into wrestling is as an analyst on WWE backstage. Now this does rub some people the wrong way. There are some people in the WWE, competitors that don't love this, somebody that has not been kind about the company or the business, who is no longer a part of it, who is being critical of the business now, but there are others that are gonna tune in week to week because they wanna hear what CM Punk's gotta say. His role as a host on that show was short-lived, but the show itself was short-lived. And that's kind of the end for a period of time of CM Punk being involved in wrestling once again. He does some uh, MMA commentary, he's here and there, until rumblings start happening in 2021, after the pandemic, that CM Punk is showing up in AEW, and he does just that. In August of 2021, CM Punk, again, has a surprise comeback, which is, I, I mean, people know he's coming. It's just not announced. It's one of those uh, 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 wonderful surprises. The pop he gets is not a, what, yeah? What, yeah! It's a, yes! Two different deals. But he comes out on AEW and he gets a lot of attention on that product. He gets a lot of attention to what he's doing. He tells some great stories over there. He tells a great story with MJF. Eventually he gets to the world title, tells a story with Hangman Page, wins the AEW championship, ends up injured. That was in uh, May of 2022. He's injured. He steps away from AEW to heal up. About three months later in September of 2022, he's back. He uh, wins a title match against John Moxley, but on his way there, things get wonky. He uh, uh, is very public about uh, things that, that, that were done to him and uh, maybe not penalized by the powers that be in AEW. And it ends with, of course, brawl out in September uh, of 2022, which is the press conference in which CM Punk was eating a muffin, uh, explaining that he's uh, old, tired, and works with children, uh, ending up in a brawl, which ended up in a uh, suspension, I believe, to CM Punk. And I think he was injured as well. So who knows how much of it was suspension, how much of it was injury. It's never fully been made public. But there is speculation that he'll never be back in AEW after that. Nine months later, he is back, and he's the face of a new show called Collision 
on AEW. They're starting their own Saturday night show. CM Punk is back. He's working with The Revival. He's got his friends around him. He's working with Ricky Starks. Things are looking okay. You start hearing rumblings. People aren't happy. This guy's not happy. That guy's not happy. It feels a little bit out of control. They have their biggest show uh, in the history of, of their company. And as they would have you believe in the industry, uh, and CM Punk ends up in an altercation with Jungle Jack Perry uh, backstage right before the show goes on the air. And CM Punk is fired from AEW. And the question is, where does he go? I'll tell you the one thing we know about CM Punk now. He ain't under the devil mask, that's for sure. Because where does he go? He goes to the Allstate Arena and he shows up on Saturday night after the war games had concluded at Survivor Series. I believe that CM Punk may be the person with the single most interesting story to tell in the world of wrestling. I mean, I can't think of a person that has had a more interesting career, that has had a more interesting journey, that can just go out as himself and have more people interested in him than CM Punk. I mean, it is wild. When you look at stars that have become superstars in the WWE that have been put on that list of you will never see him here again. He is persona non grata. Who do you really have, right? I can think of four. You have Macho Man Randy Savage, right? Who did end up without physically ever being on television again, coming back into the fold through uh, a Hall of Fame induction, through uh, a Mattel action figure, which he made a video for at a Comic-Con, through video games. You've got the Ultimate Warrior, who ended up coming back at the very end of his life, which is the, the I'm, something that I am so happy for Warrior and his entire family that that happened. Cuts an amazing promo, and then that's it. Brett the Hitman Hart, who swore never again until there was again. And finally, CM Punk. That's the family. This is the Mount Rushmore of blacklisted stars that the fans demanded to see once more. Macho Man Randy Savage, The Ultimate Warrior, Brett the Hitman Hart, and CM Punk. Here's the difference, and here's what makes this return even more interesting than any of those others that I just mentioned. None of the others returned in a way where they could still get in the ring. None of the others returned in a way where they could put tights back on. The Ultimate Warrior was able to cut a promo. Macho Man Randy Savage was able to be merchandised. Brett the Hitman Hart was able to have a couple matches, but he had to wear jorts. CM Punk is wrestling again. Basically, AEW brought CM Punk back into wrestling, blew any dust off of him, got the ring rust off, and prepped him for a WWE return. And here we are. And, you know, I, I, I think that because there has been so much drama around CM Punk, people are going to have different opinions about him. And I think that that's great. That's okay. That's what it means to be interesting. When people say, people love to talk about this guy, it doesn't just mean one thing. Like it means all of that, right? And I think that that's good. I think that, that the reality is that as a wrestling fan, which is the perspective that I speak from because it's the only perspective that I can speak from. And I think it's the perspective that all of us listening are in. All you can do is follow your emotions. All you can do is follow how you feel when you hear the music play, when you see that guy on screen. And it's good, man. It feels good. It feels like, oh my God, we are seeing, this is a moment. This is a forever moment. 
We sat there. I sat there watching on, on, on Saturday or Friday, whatever, before war games this year. I watched last year's war games. And I thought to myself, man, it's really cool that the WWE is in a position where in the men's war games match, they can put together a five-man team of baby faces and everyone on that team is a main event player. Randy Orton, Seth Rollins, Cody Rhodes, Jay Uso, and Sami Zayn. All five, all main event baby faces. When was the last time that happened? Against a group of heels that are actually compelling in the Judgment Day and Drew McIntyre. But as great as that is, how are they ever going to top how dramatic the ending of last year's War Games match was? How can you top the bloodline finally taking in Sami Zayn. How? The answer, banner now, now, banner now, now. They did it. The answer is CM Punk coming back. I would argue this is bigger than Sting showing up at Survivor Series. You know, I mean, this is on that list of like the biggest Survivor Series debuts or returns. We got to rank it with The Undertaker's debut. Sting's WWE debut, CM Punk's return. And you're going to argue until you're blue in the face as to how that ranks. So what does CM Punk look like in a 2023, 2024 WWE environment? Well, like I said, it changes absolutely everything. And you know, I mean, there are going to be people there that have real beefs with the guy. The guy has been a polarizing figure, not only to people in the audience, but it's been made very, very clear to any of us that listen to anything anywhere having to do with wrestling, that people within the industry are very polarized when it comes to CM Punk. The WWE is at this place where, where, seems as though the locker room is more harmonious than it's ever been, that people are are happy and that the product is hot. So is it a risk bringing CM Punk in after all the drama that's gone on? Is it a risk? I would say you have to just think logically about it. Think logically about what we know. The fact of the matter is that the WWE is a very well-oiled, disciplined machine. There are rankings that go right up. There's a reason why everything that happens in WWE happens smoothly, directly, without issue. Because there's there's a discipline to that company. There's a chain of command. There's there's it, it almost feels like they've been making wrestling for 50 years, and they figured out how to do it. That's the environment that CM Punk is coming into. CM Punk is also coming into an environment where, let's be honest, he adds tremendously to the product. But the product is as hot as it's been in many years without him. And that guy knows that. WWE did not bring CM Punk in to save them. WWE brought CM Punk in to just give us more. How about more? How about more? You heard Triple H in the press conference if you watched it. It's not about, you know, how do we maintain? It's about how big can we actually make this? Like, Vince McMahon created this wrestling organization that is doing things and that has historically done things that nobody ever thought a professional wrestling organization could. Now, we're at this amazing space where you've got key business people like Ari Emanuel, key wrestling people like Paul Levesque, and key people that are in between like Nick Khan, putting all their brains together and going, how big Can we actually make this? What if as big as it's gotten, we're only scratching the surface? Yeah, this is good. What about more? 
And that's what we've got with CM Punk showing up. What about more? The speculation has already started running wild. Of course, there is video evidence. All of the wrestling content creators are out there letting you know there are already problems in the WWE locker room. There are already problems. You hear the people, they go, they see it. We saw the video. We saw Seth Rollins cursing him out. We know Seth has beef with CM Punk. He has said in interviews that he doesn't like the guy. He said as recently as 10 months ago that he didn't want Phil, Philly boy. He didn't want him in a locker room with them and that he's a jerk. We know Seth Rollins doesn't like CM Punk, okay? And we saw Seth Rollins cursing out CM Punk. We saw Drew McIntyre leaving in a huff. We saw Rhea Ripley mocking him. And we go, there's already problems in the WWE locker room. I can't believe it. And they go, Seth was reacting that way because he was so pissed. And Drew was marching off because he was pissed. And you go, okay, so by your logic, Seth was pissed because he saw Punk and didn't realize he was coming. Yep, that's right. And Drew marched off before Punk got there. Yeah, that's right. So how did Drew know to get pissed before CM Punk got there? And Seth didn't get pissed until after CM Punk got there. Did somebody tell Drew and not tell Seth? I'm just trying to make sure that we follow the same logic chain here. I'm not saying that none of that was real. And I'm not saying there isn't real animosity. I believe there is real animosity between Seth Rollins and CM Punk. I believe there's real animosity between Cody Rhodes and CM Punk. I believe there could be real animosity between Drew Beckett. Everybody could have real animosity with CM Punk. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. But what I am saying is that just because we see it doesn't mean we should forget we're watching a wrestling show, right? People go, well, you could see Drew McIntyre. He left in a huff. He left very angry. He knew what was coming. He wanted to get out of there. He didn't have to deal with it. And then he left immediately after. I read it on the internet. And you go, that's, that's possible. Possible. I'm not saying that didn't happen. But what I'm also saying is, as intelligent people, we go, well, maybe he left because that was the last match. When did you want him to leave? When else was he going to leave? The show was over. <laughs> like, he wasn't going to the press conference. He finished his match. That's when everybody left. After the match. And you go, yeah, but then why did he look pissed when he was leaving? I don't know. Maybe because CM Punk was coming out. But also maybe because he looked pissed in the middle of the match when Damian Priest was telling him in character to stick to the plan, I'm going to go in first, not you. He was literally pissed the whole match. So in character, Drew should have been pissed leaving the ring because he trusted the Judgment Day's plan and they lost. Was Drew Galloway pissed that CM Punk was coming out? Or was Drew McIntyre, the character, pissed that the Judgment Day's plan didn't work? There is no evidence, based on the footage that I've seen, that we weren't just witnessing Drew McIntyre in character pissed at his team. Well, what about Seth Rollins? What about Seth Rollins? You're saying that a guy at ringside after winning a match has this guy that he's talked smack with on the internet. This guy comes out and Seth starts cursing him out. He knows he's not on television so he can curse, but the cameras are on him. I mean, I don't want to have to spell this out for you. I mean, we've got to end up getting a Seth Rollins versus CM Punk match. And if we're going to get a Seth Rollins versus CM Punk match, this is exactly how you'd want to have it. But this is the magic of CM Punk. This is why it's great having CM Punk back. Because the minute, the minute, because if those guys did the exact same thing with any other wrestler, we'd go like, oh, cool, we got a storyline brewing. But because they do it with CM Punk, we as people that have been watching wrestling for decades, we as adult 
intelligent wrestling fans look at it and going, no, I think it's real. Why? Because CM Punk is back. That's the magic of CM Punk, in my opinion. And the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, okay, you got Seth mad at him. You got Drew mad at him. You got Rhea Ripley mad at him. Everywhere you go, there's rumors. Somehow they kept it under wraps that CM Punk was returning to WWE. But the fact that the locker room is not happy about it, they can't keep that under wraps, right? Why would they want the whole, it, why would they want it to seem like the whole locker room was mad at CM Punk? I don't know. What's the next premium live event after the one that we saw this weekend at Survivor Series? What's the next one? I'll give you a hint. There's none in December. Royal Rumble is the next premium live event. What would it look like if CM Punk's first match back in the WWE was the Royal Rumble match? The same match that he left. His last match was the Royal Rumble in 2014. What if his first match back is the Royal Rumble 2024? Except this time, he's entering into a Royal Rumble where the entire roster hates him. What would that look like? I'm not saying that's what's happening, but I am saying that all the elements of that being a possibility were right in front of us at Survivor Series. And my God, was it magnificent. I mean, there's so, there, there, there's, this is why punk changes everything. There's so much for, for him to do. And, and, and what would I do? You know, Triple H was talking about it at the press conference. He said that he's a different person and that CM Punk is a different person and that CM Punk is now at home where he belongs. Amazing to hear that coming from the guy who he was supposed to have the match with CM Punk at WrestleMania that CM Punk split for. Now he's in charge of the company and CM Punk comes back for it. Takes a picture with him. Does the point. CM Punk did the point with Triple H. What? What reality are we in? What era is this? The anything can happen era. The anything is now possible era is the era that we're in. So how do I want to see CM Punk used in WWE? Uh, sporadically is not the right word, but big matches only. It's really the same thing that I said about him in AEW. CM Punk is an attraction. He is an attraction superstar. People, he, CM Punk, because of what I just said, because people believe it's real when CM Punk is involved. And you can't do that week in and week out, but you can do that multiple times a year. People will pay big money to see the big CM Punk match. You've got 200 rings across this. You got all these rings in the performance center. You got all, all these different spots that you could make sure that CM Punk is staying in ring shape and that CM Punk for himself could stay in ring shape for. So that the only time he's wrestling for the WWE, it's in giant marquee matches. It's at the Royal Rumble. It's at WrestleMania. It's at SummerSlam. It's at Survivor Series. It's at Money in the Bank, wherever it is. Put him on that Brock schedule. I don't need to see him wrestle on Raw. Give him a microphone on Raw. Not every week either. Give him a microphone on Raw. Have him wrestle at a few big pay-per-views. And we got some big pay-per-views this year, boy. We got Elimination Chamber. We got, we got Royal Rumble in a baseball stadium. We got Elimination Chamber in Australia. We got... Two nights in a stadium for WrestleMania. We got Backlash in Paris, France. We got Berlin, Bash at Berlin. We're all over the place. Lots of opportunity for CM Punk to come in and make a huge impact. And all you've got, all you've got for CM Punk are matches upon matches upon matches. You've got the everyone is mad at CM Punk Royal Rumble match right in front of you for January. If you're not doing Seth Rollins versus CM Punk at WrestleMania, I don't know what you're doing. To me, that's a no-brainer. Now, it is what you could do, CM Punk winning the Royal Rumble, and then he challenges Seth Rollins at WrestleMania, I mean, to me, 
if you don't have The Rock and you may not have The Rock because the actor strike is over, so he's probably going back to work. CM Punk versus Seth Rollins night one, Roman versus Cody Rhodes night two, you may end up selling out two stadiums. How could you get bigger? That, right there, right? You've got Cody Rhodes versus CM Punk. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Go back to the last AEW promo that Cody Rhodes ever cut. Go back to it and listen to him as he, without a feud for CM Punk, he just had this on his chest. He had this on the brain. Explain that everything that CM Punk talked about in the pipe bomb, everything that CM Punk claimed he could do, Cody Rhodes went out and did it. CM Punk says he can change the industry and Cody Rhodes did it. These are the words that Cody Rhodes spoke. There was no comeuppance for those words. We know the history. We know what happened there. Cody Rhodes versus CM Punk, the history in that match. You don't want to see Cody Rhodes versus CM Punk. Can you imagine if Cody Rhodes beats Roman Reigns at WrestleMania and still in front of him are Randy Orton and CM Punk as potential championship opponents? Forget about it. What about Randy Orton? How about the fact that we could see what CM Punk versus Randy Orton in 2024 actually looks like? How about that? How about the fact that something that we really got to think about before we get to WrestleMania, if you really want Cody Rhodes to finish the story against Roman Reigns, I think a lot of people do. The bloodline story, the Roman Reigns story has been built upon Roman destroying every unsurmountable obstacle. Everything that couldn't be destroyed before Roman is destroying. What about CM Punk versus Roman Reigns? If we're going to do CM Punk versus Roman Reigns, don't we want to do that when Roman is still the champion? Don't we want to do that before anybody's beaten Roman? Don't we want to tell the story of CM Punk being the guy to finally do it and Roman putting him in his place? It certainly, oh, you go, well, how do you get there? Maybe we don't do Seth versus CM Punk at WrestleMania. Maybe we do CM Punk versus Roman at WrestleMania. I personally would prefer CM Punk versus Seth at WrestleMania. That'd be my preference. But what I'm telling you is Roman Reigns has beaten Edge. He's beaten Daniel Bryan. He's beaten John Cena. He's beaten Brock Lesnar. Who else is on the list? He's beaten Cody Rhodes. There's two guys that Roman hasn't beaten. Randy Orton and CM Punk. And they're both at play here. Do you understand the amount of pieces that are now on the table? What's right in front of our face? Oh, have mercy. Oh my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. So here we are with CM Punk back in the WWE. I personally, I don't think it's even a healthy thing to try to predict how long it's going to last. Is he going to screw this up? Is he going to screw that up? CM Punk could get fed up with the whole thing and bounce before WrestleMania. We don't know, but what we do know is as we sit here and talk about it right now, it's freaking awesome. According to reports, this deal was done over the last like 10 days leading up to Survivor Series and that it is a multi-year deal that was signed. And I think that if you're in a situation where both parties are aware what you're doing here, Punk, we're not bringing you in to go week in, week out. We're not bringing you in to elevate the company. We're not bringing you in to, to work with young guys. We're not bringing you in for any of that. We're bringing you in for super fights. We're bringing you in because you are a valuable commodity. Because what do you have to offer? A lot, and we'd like to utilize that. 
And to me, I think that that's key to running a business. If you're going to hire talent, you need to figure out what exactly is the talent that your talent has. And you need to utilize that specific talent. And everybody said, oh, I wanna build up the next thing. I wanna build up the next thing. How about this? Build up the next thing by selling tickets for everybody. Don't worry about getting Grayson Waller over. You have your match with Roman Reigns. Get a stadium full of people. And that stadium full of people will see Grayson Waller in his own match. That's how you get Grayson Waller over. I want the Punk super fights. I want Punk and Roman. I want Punk in the Rumble. I want Punk and Seth. I want Punk and Cody. I want Punk and Randy. I, I want Punk in LA Knight. Can you believe? Imagine CM Punk versus LA Knight. LA Knight is the CM Punk story, just in a completely different package. I mean, they're photo negatives of each other. They're both the guys who had to scratch and claw to get to exactly where they are. But LA Knight is the guy with the polish on him. LA Knight is the guy who you don't even see. I don't know who that person is. I have no idea who the LA Knight person is. I know who the character is. But LA Knight has a giant wall up in front of him. LA Knight presents the character and that's all you get. CM Punk, there ain't no character. It's Phil. He's the guy. Two polar opposites. Can you imagine the promos that we'd get between LA Knight and CM Punk? The fact that LA Knight has worked too damn hard to just give up the spotlight to CM Punk and allow him to take advantage of him in any stretch, but CM Punk is not gonna take that from LA Knight either. Just for the story alone leading to the match. Heel, babyface, I don't think it really matters. I think you look at your top stars in the WWE and you 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 pit them against CM Punk and you've got some of the more compelling television that I can possibly think of. Now we brought up Randy Orton and the, pot, the potential of Randy Orton uh, 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 having a match with CM Punk in this era. And that's because rule number three has officially ended. Randy Orton returns at Survivor Series War Games. I thought it was played out really, really well. I mean, everybody had different thoughts, right? Sami Zayn is the is the is the uh, proverbial peacemaker, just uh, always trying to make sure that everybody. It's okay. It's cool. It's cool. I believe you. I believe you. It's cool. It's cool. Seth Rollins doesn't trust Cody Rhodes any farther than he can throw him. Although he can kind of throw Cody Rhodes, that's probably not the best example there. But Seth Rollins doesn't have a lick of trust for Cody Rhodes. No, he's coming. Whatever, Cody. Whatever, I don't like you. Jay Uso thinks it's his fault. Jay Uso is paranoid about 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 Randy Orton. Jay Uso, the performance of Jay Uso. First of all, just watching him in that War Games match and watching him as a bona fide main event babyface talent. It's like you almost go, never mind. I I at one point had a thing where it's like, what if we rebuild the bloodline on the way to WrestleMania? No. Jey Uso is a main event. He's actually a main event guy. He was called main event Jey Uso, but forever he was really only a main eventer in the context of wrestling Roman Reigns. Now, Jey Uso is a main event babyface. Period. You've made another star. And there ain't no reason to mess with that. But the fact that Randy Orton comes up and Jey Uso goes right back into scalded dog, right back into puppy dog zone, incredible. Increíble. Because it's not just that he's paranoid about Randy Orton. You saw it in the face that he made on Raw when Randy Orton was announced. You saw it in the promo before War Games. You saw it in the War Games cage. That face is the same face that we saw Jey Uso make for Roman Reigns when he was trying to please Roman Reigns. We're not seeing just Jay being worried about Randy Orton. 
we're seeing deep emotional trauma, emotional damage done to Jey Uso by Roman Reigns. That is what we're seeing. We are seeing the depths of the emotional trauma inflicted upon Jey Uso by Roman Reigns. And Randy Orton triggers that. He brings it all flooding back. That's not just the same face. Those are the same feelings. That's the complexity of the stories that we're telling in the WWE as it pertains to the bloodline. That there was a level of emotional trauma done to that dude that is still recessed, that is still buried deep in to that Uso brain of Jay. And I, and I think it's just brilliant storytelling that Randy Orton brings it all out again. Because Jay Uso is finding out when he looks at Randy Orton, when he looks at Kevin Owens, when he looks at Drew McIntyre, that you can be done with your past, but my friend, your past ain't done with you. That's a life lesson that we've all had to figure out at some point or another. And Jay Uso decided for years to be a scumbag to benefit the tribal chief. And now that he's a, on his own, he knows that he's got a lot to pay for, for what he did. I think it's just brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, so the fact that Cody had faith in it the whole time, the fact that uh, uh, Jay was worried about it, Seth didn't trust it, and the whole story is, is being played out to the point where while people expect Randy Orton, it's professional wrestling, and we know that anything could happen. Randy Orton ain't in that shark cage. Brilliant way to not only build anticipation, but allow Randy to have that pop, allow Randy's music to play, allow Randy, because the first time Randy appears, you're going to get that reaction. And for Randy to appear that first time and then spend the next 25 minutes sitting in a shark cage because for some godforsaken reason, war games can't begin until everybody slowly makes their way into that double ring would be a waste of the, of, of the reaction. Played out perfectly. The audience just bit it hook, line, and sinker. The ovation was huge when Randy came out. There was nothing about Randy coming out, by the way, that makes me think, oh yeah, he should turn heel right now. There was nothing about Randy coming out that made me think, oh yeah, they should go with Randy versus Cody on the way to WrestleMania. We're not that far away from WrestleMania. December, January, February, and March. We're four months away from WrestleMania. There is no way that you can properly tell the story of Randy turning heel, Randy facing off with Cody Rhodes, Cody Rhodes winning, and then Cody Rhodes building something with Roman Reigns on the way to WrestleMania. In time for WrestleMania. You can't do it. And if you did, it'd be rushed and it would be a waste. If you're gonna do Cody versus Randy, you have to do it after WrestleMania. Plus, Randy's got more than enough to deal with. Who knows what's going on with Jey Uso? Who knows what's going on? We, we've got, you know, who, who are the opponents now for the Judgment Day? We've seen Cody fight the Judgment Day. It's been a hundred consecutive weeks of Raw that we've seen Cody Rhodes face the Judgment Day. So what have we got now? Well, we got Randy Orton back. What if it's Randy and Sami Zayn on a team together? What if Randy and Jey Uso are on a team together? And Jay starts kind of slipping back into that, okay, whatever you want, whatever you want, because he's got that Roman trauma. There's plenty to do, but I don't know that turning Randy Orton heel right now would be the right move, especially if you've got Drew McIntyre and the Judgment Day. I don't know. I mean, you got a lot of baby faces, sure. But everybody loves Randy Orton. Everybody's super happy he's back. They did such a smart thing, you know, because... Again, you go back to the discipline. An undisciplined way of telling the story would be just have Randy Orton jump in there and RKO everybody because it'd be so cool to just instantly see it. But they made, he made you wait. Ooh, you had to wait for that RKO so that it felt good. He made you wait for that RKO and then boom, hit it. And then that RKO on JD McDonough 
as J.D. McDonough fell off the cage, not fell off, got thrown off the cage, but as Randy Orton was like calling for it and you saw them calling for it and then Randy Orton hits it. By the way, Randy Orton was looking huge. Had the buys and the tries, the six pack and those, he had some big legs on him, boy. Quads and hammies on fleek, as one might say. Oh, I was so happy to see Randy Orton back. Randy Orton is one of the all-time greats as far as just a performer goes. It's hard to imagine a better wrestler than Randy Orton. To see him back was just, uh, I mean, so cool. And the fact that, like, we get everything that we've gotten with WWE, and now we've got CM Punk and Randy Orton also involved, and the announcement's been made that on Monday night, which this comes out Monday morning, so maybe by the time you see it, it's already happened, we've got Randy Orton and CM Punk on the show. I can't wait. I can't wait to hear what these guys have to say. Uh, elsewhere uh, on Survivor Series, I feel like we've buried the lead in a big way. You talk about pops. How about getting a pop even though you're part of a segment that's backstage? Our truths return in a Ruffles commercial. And everybody is so happy to see our truth come back. Can we all just get along? And then, I mean, Tazawa, I'll tell you what sold it for me. Tazawa's Ruffle Shuffle, to me, was probably the best product placement that I've ever seen because I, it made me laugh. I loved the segment. Not because of what the Ruffle Shuffle actually was, not because of how happy I was that our truth was back, not because of how much I enjoy the way uh, uh, Otis says chips. Chip! Chap, crisp, chap. It was because, I don't know if it's his natural instinct, but when Tazawa does the ruffle shuffle, he just goes dead-eyed. <laughs> just thinking about it. Like, why would you go dead-eyed? He like, he's like, here we go, here we go. Uh, and then he starts doing the ruffle shuffle. It's so. It was so good. It was so good. So good to see R-Truth back again. Somebody that adds tremendously to whatever show that he's on. And now we've got him back. How do we make it better? How about more? You like the show now? What if it, we gave you more? What if it was more? What if you had Punk and Orton and Truth back on the show? Would you like that? Yeah, I would like that. Speaking of Ruffles, by the way, had Rey Mysterio been in the women's war games match, he would have won undeniably. Sponsored match. Nobody's got a sponsored streak the way Rey Mysterio has. But we did see damage control go down to Charlotte, Becky, uh, Bianca, and Shotzi. And I really loved the reaction. I thought that the Chicago crowd, and it's no surprise because Chicago is such a good wrestling city, but the Chicago crowd was so good throughout the entire Survivor Series show, fantastic. I, I thought, you know, I love a good crowd and Chicago was a great wrestling crowd. Um, and I, I, I loved the moment that Charlotte and Becky finally get together. The moment that they've, and it's like, because we've been on this journey, so many of us. Now there are some people who just started watching, whatever, like, that's cool too, right? And 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 for those folks, this is great because you've got Becky and Charlotte who are the two biggest female stars in the industry coming together. But for those of us that have really been on the journey and realized that these two four horsewomen who have gone on to change the industry and we've watched them, we watched the awkward belt exchange. We watched the comments that are made in interviews. We've watched all the tension exist. And we see them embrace. We see them come together. We see them climb to the top of the cage after they're victorious in that match. And they do the tea thing with each other. Beautiful, beautiful moment for all of us fans. Like I've said many, many times, everything counts. In this era of WWE, everything counts. 
It's one of the things that makes it so fun. Uh, so yeah, I couldn't help though, as I'm watching, right? I thought damage control looked amazing. All coming out in kabuki masks. Just so, just like a, a super cool visual. I hope Bill McKenna figures out how to make like a five pack. I don't know if Dakota was standing with them when they all had kabuki masks on. Yeah, she was, because she had like a mask that was almost looked like it was from the purge. Yeah, I hope Bill McKenna figures out how to make a five pack of all the damage control women with all their kabuki masks on. Because I personally don't know that damage control is going to stay a five person faction. Now, the way I look at it, right, is that Bailey sacrificed herself to save Kyrie Sane. Bailey took the fall. Bailey lost the match for her team. But in, in doing that, she saved Kyrie, right? So it was an honorable loss. However, EO, EO, I'm going to talk about EO in a second. EO, Kyrie, and Asuka, and maybe Dakota Kai could easily say, Bailey, you're the weak link on the team. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. Throw it back. Don't actually say that on television. That reference is like 20 years old. But still, the same sentiment. And and go like, well, you know, we obviously don't need you. You lost it for our team. But Bailey is coming from this spot where she was honorable. Yes, she did take out Kyrie Sane. But in order to make up, up for that, she apologized and also sacrificed herself in that match for Kyrie. That means that the beef is squashed and that if she gets thrown out of damage control because of that, now she's a babyface. Easy road to babyface him if she gets kicked out of damage control for an action that was saving a teammate and her teammate is not thankful at all for that. In fact, uh, uh, blames her for it. If she gets kicked out of damage control, what happens with Bailey? Well, we've got Bailey, we've got Charlotte, we've got Becky Lynch, we've got Asuka, we've got Eo Sky, we've got Kyrie Sane. What happens if the three remaining horsewomen? are able to team back up to take on damage control. And why did I say, why did I say, hang on about Dakota? Well, who knows when Dakota is going to get better? Hopefully very soon, because I'm a Dakota Kai fan. But what if we left Dakota Kai with damage control? What if EO, Kyrie, Asuka, and Dakota Kai became the four-person damage control. We, I know, I know, I'm putting the horse before the carriage here, or the carriage before the horse. The horse is supposed to come before the carriage. We're putting the carriage before the horse here. I know, but, I know, but. I just saw CM Punk come back. I've seen Randy Orton back. Ultimate Warrior came back. Bret Hart came back. If Bailey, Becky, and Charlotte find themselves outnumbered against Asuka, Dakota, EO, and Kyrie, what would happen if we just heard, had a dream, I had a man, and now and now and now and now and What if we got Sasha Banks back? As Charlotte and Becky are coming together, as there is a clear road for Bailey to take that would put them with those three, has there ever been a time where it would make more sense or we could speculate wildly more on the idea of a reformation of the original four horsewomen of NXT. Can you imagine in 2024 what it would look like if the top of the industry, if the people that shifted the entire thing 
were the people who all those years ago said that that was their plan to do it. What would it look like? After WrestleMania 32, when the women's championship replaced the Divas championship, when we had that Sasha, Charlotte, Becky triple threat, what would it look like if eight years later, Charlotte, Becky Lynch, Bailey, and Sasha Banks all stood together on top of the industry? You thought we were done? You thought after CM Punk showed up at Survivor Series, we were done with big moments? What do we do on Not Sam Wrestling? Just because we're done not fantasy booking Randy Orton doesn't mean that we're done speculating wildly. We're going to watch the product and we are going to speculate wildly. And I am saying right now that CM Punk showing up at the Allstate Arena got me hungry for moments. You got me moment hungry, Hunter. So what do I need? Trips. I need Sasha Banks walking down that aisle. And I need to see the four horsewomen together one more time. That's what I need to see. And real quick, EO Sky needs to be protected at all costs. EO Sky deserves the world for that garbage can spot. I know she's done it in NXT before. She's done it here. She's done it there. Never has she done it as impressively as she did it at War Games this year. When she was like, when she first of all pulled the garbage can up with the chain, which I thought was great. And by the way, if you noticed, a pet peeve of mine is people who disregard their War Games advantage by letting the clock run out as they're pulling weapons out from the cage and putting them in the ring this year. They didn't start the timer until the wrestler was in the ring, which made everything better. Loved that they did that. Very smart. Very smart. Handsome Hunter Hearst Helmsley. So, <laughs> so, EO pulling up that garbage can and then like having to reposition herself on top of that cage and then just looking at her standing up on the top of the cage with the Allstate Arena around her. I got so, I got afraid of heights for her. And then she's got to figure out how to not fall over, pick up the garbage can, put it on her head and do a crossbody. Unbelievable. If you didn't see that spot, see that spot. This is what you need to see from Survivor Series. If you just want to see spots, you need to see EO's garbage can spot. You need to see that heartwarming moment of Charlotte and Becky cheersing their tea on top of the roof of War Games. Not the roof, but you know what I'm saying. You need to see Randy Orton returning. You need to see Randy Orton hitting that RKO off the cage on JD McDonough. And you and, and also the uh, multiple Randy Orton DDTs was super fun in the middle of that match. And you need to see CM Punk because he is officially back in the WWE. Now, I had a lot to say today. I know a lot of you guys have a lot to say. You know our email segment is the most popular thing on Not Sam Wrestling. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to hit you with a bonus episode later this week. We've, we've, we've gone over an hour already. So I'm not going to make you sit through emails now. I had to get all this off my chest. Later this week on the audio feed as well as on the YouTube channel, there will be a bonus only emails Not Sam Wrestling send those emails in to notsamwrestling at gmail.com. I'm going to probably wait until after Raw. So on Tuesday, I'm going to go through your emails and I'll post it either Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. Uh, but we'll get an emails only edition of Not Sam Wrestling later this week. 475 is this, 475B still to come. Email me, notsamwrestling at gmail.com to get all of those emails in. We got a ton of them after Survivor Series. Between, I mean, you know, this podcast recording is happening, whatever, 12 hours removed from Survivor Series. So uh, we've already had a ton of emails from Survivor Series. I'm sure it will only continue after Raw tonight. 
So uh, we'll have another emails only edition of Not Sam Wrestling uh, coming up here. Appreciate you guys. You're the best. Don't forget if you're listening on audio, uh, subscribe on Apple. If Apple's what you use, leave a rating and a review. It helps us out a lot. If you're listening on Spotify, subscribe, leave a rating. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, hit like, leave a comment, and watch here every single week, sometimes twice a week when we got to hit you back with an email segment. I'll see you in a couple days. Have a good one, everybody. I don't know if you heard. CM Punk is back.